All right, Two Cities Church, welcome. My name is Kyle Mercer. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, If you are new, if this is your first time, second time, third time, and you're saying, how do I get more connected here at Two Cities? I want to let you know about our Connect card. It's right in front of you. And if you'll take a moment, I don't mind if you do it while I'm speaking, okay? You can take a moment anytime, fill this out, drop it, and it's going to let us know about the next step that you want to take. So all we need to know is your name, your number, and a list of your fears. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) Just kidding. We don't need your number. And we will get you guys the, the information that you need as quickly as possible. No, we, we really want to help you guys get connected. It has been an incredible season as a church for us. So, so again, if, if you're new or, or maybe you've been coming around for a while, you don't know this. We are a two-year-old church, and it's been an exciting season. In fact, for us, our Christmas Eve services, uh, we had four of them over the uh, December 23rd and 24th. An incredible time of celebration. We ended up having uh, our highest attended Sunday ever, which is just kind of a picture of where we are. We're at churches. By God's grace, we're going numerically, spiritually, organizationally. Uh, and if you look around the room right now, we are at capacity in this room, and the first service was even more full than this one. And, and, and I tell you that to say one of the things we're, we're, we're realizing is that in the morning, in our 9.15 and our 11 a.m. service, we are at capacity and we are done growing in these services. One of, the, one of the asks, one of the questions we have for those of you who call Two Cities Home is, would you serve our church? If you have an ability, now not every person can do this, not every family can do this, but are there some of you who could move to Sunday night services to free up some seats on Sunday morning? Because the, the truth is, uh, the seeker, the skeptic, uh, the new guest, the first time visitor, the, the, the most likely service for them to come to is a morning service. Uh, and so if, if, if that's something that you could do or prayerfully consider, we'd ask you to do that. That's one thing we're, we're kind of asking as we go into the new year. And then something I want to celebrate with you. At the end of the last year, we, uh, a couple weeks ago, you know, we, we said, hey, what would it look like to take up a special offering for three partners? A partner in Brooklyn, uh, New York, that's the Dagleys who are, uh, who pl- who are replanting uh, Park Slope Community Church. We said, what would it look like to take up an offering uh, as well for uh, the Goff family in Laos and then for, uh, in Mumbai, India, for four strategic ministries that are happening there? And we said, would, we didn't have a financial goal. We had a congregational goal. We said, what would it look like for, uh, to have 100% participation from the congregation? And, and I'm real excited to tell you guys that, and they don't even know this yet, we're going to be able to, to kind of share this in the next week. But we were able to together give $47,643.03. Amen. And I, I know, hey, I know what you're thinking. You're, you're thinking, who gave three cents? I, I don't know. <laughs> but we're just telling you, that's what came in. We're just going to be honest about that. We're very, very excited. And here's what's really cool. I've got a really neat job in the next week, or maybe someone else on our staff will also help me with this. But um, we're going to get to call these people. Uh, because er- that money represents families, it represents ministries, it represents couples that we're going to be able to call and say, hey, well, this is hopefully going to help you go further faster in your ministry. This is going to hopefully help you. And what's something that you want to do? You know, uh, we told you before, the Dagleys, they, they have a heart for kids ministry in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, basically, we're about to give them uh, almost enough money to do that completely by themselves. So just very, very excited. Thank you guys for your generosity. Let's pray and thank the Lord, and then we'll dive into our series. Lord, we give because you first gave. That's the gospel. Lord, I thank you that Two City Church from day one has been a generous church. Whether it's being consistently generous week in and week out or when there's a unique opportunity to give to a unique vision or unique need that uh, people have rise up, risen up and done that. So, Lord, I, I pray that you would bless your word today as we look at a brand new book together. In Christ's name we pray this. Amen. Well, you can open up your Bible to Judges chapter 1. And I'm going to meet you there in about five minutes. I'm going to give you a little Judges introduction, okay? Open up your Bibles. Now you go, Judges... You're like, I I didn't get that far in my Bible reading plan. That's okay. (laughs) Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, okay? And and let's be honest, it it tends to be a book that people aren't very familiar with. Like, Judges? Is this a political book? No. Is this about the next Supreme Court justice? Maybe. No. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Just kidding. No. Um, So what, what is it about? Well, it's a unique book. There's 12 judges in this book. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of touch on each one of them. There's 12 different judges in this book. Some, some of the judges, like you may have heard of Gideon before, he gets three chapters. Uh, you may have heard of um, Samson, he gets three chapters. You probably never heard of Shamgar. He gets one verse, okay? That's how some people's lives are. <laughs> We're not going to talk about him a ton, but, but we will mention him. Um, and, and this book is interesting. So when you think judge, don't think, you know, black gown. Don't think, uh, you know, political system. When you think judge, uh, another word we'll see that comes up sometimes is deliverer. Another word that sometimes comes up is savior. And what, here's what the book of Judges is. It's the leaders in between Moses and Joshua and the kings. 
So there was a long history, a season before there were kings, but after there was just a clear single leader, Moses for a while, or you know, Joshua for a while. And, and here's what's interesting, and I don't want to give too much away, but what's interesting in the book of Judges is the judges are faithful but flawed, and over time, they become less faithful and more flawed. And, and, and what this book is about is it's really about the Christian life. So you may go, I don't know how this is going to be relevant as we study the book of Judges for the next few months, but I promise you it is one of the most relevant books, uh, I believe, all well, the whole Bible is relevant, but, but it's an incredibly relevant book for our time because it talks about the sin cycle that we all go through. And, and if you've ever, and I know, if you're, you know if you're a Christian, the answer is yes, if you've ever said to the Lord, I will never do that again, now I promise I'll never do it again. I'll never look at that again. I'll never say that again. I'll never be in that. I'll never text him again. I, you know, whatever it is. And you, and you, you promised, and you, you know, you're not even sure if you should have, but you, you know, you made a covenant with God, and you just said you were never going to do it again. And then sometimes it's the next day or the next hour, or, or sometimes it's the next week or next year, but, but you end up giving back into a certain sin or a habit, something you said you were going to stop doing, you started doing, something you said you were going to start doing, you stopped doing. Uh, and, and that's the story. And, and let me tell you how this book goes. And every one of these, God gives clear direction. Here's, you know, here's what I want you to do for my word. It's very clear. And it's always for their good. He gives clear direction, but then they disobey. Does this begin to sound familiar? They disobey like, yeah, that was a good idea, but God, but not as good of an idea as what I think I should do. And then every time they disobey, it doesn't take too long until discipline and destruction come into their life because of their disobedience. And then they cry out for God to send a deliverer or a judge. And then the deliverer comes, and he gives them a clear direction from the Lord. And says, this is what you need to do, and this is what you shouldn't do. And they said, well, we'll obey. And then they don't obey. They disobey. And then there's more discipline, and there's more death, and there's more destruction. And then they cry out to God again for a deliverer. And, well, you know, you're like, yeah, this is what the whole book's about. Uh, But but it's very interesting. Every chapter's different. We're going to learn a lot of different things. Uh, One one quick warning for for the parents in the room. Um, We love having kids in the services, and, and you're always welcome to bring any of your kids at any times to any of our services. What I will say is starting next week especially, uh, the book gets colorful in its language. Uh, even just, so you, I would encourage you if you're a parent to read the book. Uh, it gets colorful in, in some of the ways that, that God talks about sin. And it's, it's not, it's because the Bible's an honest book. And, and it's a real book. And, and, the, and there's a lot of violence in this book. And it's because sin is really destructive. And, and, and so there's just, a, there's a rawness and an honesty. So we want just parents to, you're welcome to have your kids in service. But just have that conversation. Be, be ready. I'm only going to say what the Bible says, but it gets fairly graphic. Uh, as we go through this book together. But it's because sin is always destructive to us, and then the other painful thing you realize in this book, and to everyone we're connected to. You know, it's bad enough that sin just affects me, but now it also affects everybody else is, is incredibly terrible. So let's go to Genesis, or not Genesis, to Judges chapter 1, verse 1. Judges chapter 1, verse 1 says this. After the death of Joshua, now who is Joshua? An incredible leader. What's interesting is most books, well, not most books, many books in the Bible, uh, they begin with the death of somebody else. So the book of Exodus begins with the death of Joseph. Um, And the book of Joshua begins with the death of Moses. And now this book, the book of Judges, ends with the death of Joshua. Here's one of the things, it's just, it's a good kind of beginning of the new year, we're thinking about it. You get, here's here's kind of a big idea from the death of Joseph, or death of uh, Joshua here. You get one life to make a count. Joshua got one life, and we'll talk about him a little bit more next week because he's brought up again in chapter two, but what we're told is he was faithful, and because he was faithful, the people that were connected to him, his children in that generation, they walked with the Lord, and then we find out Joshua dies. Here's what this means. You get one life. It's very short. There's an old saying, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last, and what we see with Joshua as he gets that one life and he dies, and then here's the humbling part. So, so, so the amazing kind of encouraging part is your life could count for Christ in, in ways that you wouldn't even imagine. If you would get your act together, if you would repent of your sin, if you would trust Christ, who knows the effect it could have on everybody else. But then the other humbling thing is, but you get one life, and guess what? When you die, the kingdom of God continues to go on. I mean, it's actually, incur- it's like, you know, think about it. This last year, 2018, we lost the, one of the most significant men in church history, Billy Graham. If you study your church history, there's, Billy Graham spoke to more people in person about Jesus than anyone else who's ever lived. He would go and he would fill stadiums. 
And he was friends with all of the presidents. An incredible influence. And then at 95 years old, he was faithful to the end, he died. And the kingdom of God continues to go on, and people continue to hear about Jesus. And so it's a sobering message to say at the beginning, there's the death of Joshua, but the death of something is always the beginning of something else. So this is the beginning of something new for the people of God. And let's look what it says they did. After the death of Joshua, the people inquired of the Lord. It's like, yes, this means they sought God. Great way to start your new year. Lord, what do you want me to do in my business? What do you want me to do with my family? What do you want me to do with my finances? How should I spend my time? How should I spend my weekends? How should I plan my vacations? Lord, I want to seek you. This is what they're doing. And then in verse 2, look what happens. In verse 2, it says, the Lord said, he gives them his word. This is amazing. The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I've given the land into his hand. The people of Israel started well. Here's what we're going to see today. They started well, but they didn't end well. It's much more important how you end than how you start. I do a lot of premarital counseling, and I really, really enjoy it. But at the same time, I'm like, this is, this is going to be helpful, but then you're going to get married, you know? And, <laughs> right? And, and all the married couples are laughing, uh, and everyone else is like, why is that funny? Um, no, because then you realize, wait a second, now I'm actually in this marriage, and now it's not so much how I started. That is really important, really important. That's why premarital counseling is important and vows and everything else. But then you realize, well, actually, what's more important is not the first day, but the last day. And so what we begin to see here is, is they started off really, really well. They're seeking the Lord. They're praying to the Lord, and then they're hearing his word. Now, here's what you need to know about God's word. The way you respond to God's word is how you respond to God. So you can't say, you know, I really love God, and I don't love his word. Same thing. God has the closest possible relationship with his word that you could ever imagine. In such a way that to obey God's word is to obey God. And to love God's word is to love God. And to disobey God's word is to disobey God. And so early on in the book... You have this incredible, I won't read it all to you because it's a lot of the ites, right? It's the Amalekites and the Canaanites and the Electrolytes and the Termites. Are y'all listening? And so it's all these ites and they're beating the ites, okay? And they're like, this is amazing. And it's all the first 18 verses. It's like, we prayed, we listened to God's word, we did what he said, we're having victory. And then I want you to look at verse 19 in your, in your Bible. Judges chapter one, verse 19 in Judges 1, 19, everything changes. It says this, And the Lord was with Judah, and he took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. Now listen, if you go back to verse 2, just briefly, you can look at it. God says, I'm giving you the land. So God shows up in Scripture and says, I'm a giver and a foregiver. That's what I am. And what I want to do is I want to give you. I want to give you salvation. I want to give you forgiveness. I want to give you my word. I want to give you my son. I want to give you my spirit. I want to give you my church. And I'm going to give, but you need to receive. It's very, very simple. Christianity is simple, not easy. God says, I will give. You need to receive. In other words, you need to welcome. You need to embrace. You need to, in the best sense of the word, take it. And go, God, thank you. I'm going to do what you said, and I'm going to take what you've given. I'm going to embrace what you've given to me. Well, do you see what it says in verse 19? It says, they could not drive out the inhabitants. Now, what this is here is, it's the Israelites talking about their time in the land, and they're telling God, we could not do it. But God told them, they must do it. They have to do it. So go, just follow me. This gets a little tricky for a moment. But go to Judges 2, verse 2. This is, this is interesting. In Judges 2, verse 2, God says this, And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, and then here's the main issue, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this that you have done? So here's the big idea for today. Where has God told you, or where, ha, where are you saying, I cannot, and God said, you will not? Where are you saying, I could not, like they say in verse 19, but God says, actually, really, you would not. And this is a real, it's actually, I didn't even plan this. This is a great beginning of January message. Because what it's asking is it's asking you, what are the areas of your life that you're going, uh, I know God said this, but I'm not going to obey him in this area of my life. I'll obey him in 95% of the areas of my life. It really comes down to this. It's the number one lie that Christians tell themselves, and it's this. I only have to believe part of what God says. 
I only need to obey part of God's word. And let me just tell you, in 20 years of being a Christian and 10 or 15 years of being in full-time ministry, let me tell you the areas where people go, I don't really, you know, I'm willing to obey God in every area of my life except for this one area. You know what the first one is, our sexuality. Well, God, if you knew, if you knew my genetics, if you knew my stressful job, if you knew my spouse, if you knew how lonely I was, surely when you wrote your word, you weren't talking about my situation. And by the way, one of the most dangerous things ever is to think you're the exception to some rule. Yeah, I know this is what God's word says, but I'm the exception. It's like, you're definitely not the exception. <laughs> the chance of you being you know, the exception is 0%. And, and so there, there's this idea of, of our sexuality, and, and it shows up a couple of different ways. It shows up in uh, the just study after study talking about not just non-Christians, but the amount of Christians that uh, admit, which means it's probably more than this, admit to consistently looking at pornography. It's like, Lord, I, I'll obey you. You know, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be a virgin until I get married, but I'm gonna look at pornography. Maybe we would never say that out loud, but it's like, a, well, you know, and then and the culture doesn't help much. They just tell you it's a rite of passage. It's a rite of passage and it's normal. It's not normal. It's not a rite of passage. To stare upon other people's nakedness is not normal. And some people say, well, you know what? It's not hurting anybody. That's what, so it doesn't really hurt anyone. Well, it actually destroys the mind that God's given you. And they've actually done, there's actually scientific studies that talk about there's that how uh, pornography re rewires the human brain. It creates new neuron pathways in your brain, like big ditches that, that want to go in a certain direction. And then, of course, anybody in that industry is completely being just abused and destroyed and taken advantage of. And every time you look at it, you're supporting the industry. And so it's, it's multifaceted, and it's an area of your life where I just want to encourage you. There's, the grace of God is there. Here's, here's the, the grace of God goes, I've given you freedom over it. Will you take it? But you have to do it the way I said. You've got to repent, and you've got to tell somebody, and you've got to open up. Let me tell you another area that people often compromise in, cohabitating before they're married. Yes, we are the church that talks about this. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because here's why. I mean, we're just realizing that more and more... Um, people are, are living together, couples are living together before they get married. This used to be called living in sin. Literally, that's what it used to be called. It used to be called shacking up. Now it's just called, now it's kind of expected and normal. And, um, and it's interesting because I think at the end of the day, if you're really a born again Christian, you know this is not right. I, I'll tell you, I had, a, I had a phone call with them. There was a couple, not in our church. There was a couple that asked me to do their wedding. And I found out that they were living together. And I said, are you guys Christians? I was actually just talking to the, the girl, actually. She, I was talking to her. She, I said, are you, guys, you both say you're Christians. Oh, yeah, we're Christians. Did I, are y'all living together? Did I see that? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're living together, but it's for money. It's to save money. It's the, are you sleeping together? Here was her response. We try not to, but it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not here to make fun. I'm just like, that's, that's our life. That's about as honest as it gets. It's like trying hard. I don't think so. Um, you, you're, you're living together. But, but I, I tell you that story to say there, there's, there's a sense, and, you know, and I had to say that person, well, you know, I, said, I said, if you will repent of the sin, move out, live separately, and live a pure life, I'll do your wedding. I got a text a couple days later, we're going to have somebody else do our wedding. Because there's a certain pool on a person's life. And, and, and the thing is, the scripture's clear, and God's spoken on it. But then what's interesting is when science and studies and research say the exact same thing. You read anything on cohabitating and it says uh, depression goes up, uh, divorce goes up, anxiety goes up, abuse goes up. Because you can't practice marriage. You, I mean, you, you either have one last name and one life or you don't. So cohabiting, I'll tell you another one. Um, being sexually active while dating, even as Christians. So Christians, and I saw this in college, I, 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 when I was doing college ministry, there would be students who otherwise, they were following the Lord, they were excited about the Lord, and then they, get, they start dating, and they don't want to be honest anymore. They don't want to meet, they don't want to be accountable, they don't want to set boundaries. And one of the first things I do, even in, even in my, and some of you are going, I'm not doing premarital counseling with you anymore. Or, uh, I was thinking about it, but I'm not. But one of, the, one of the first, and I don't try to be, you know, I don't try to be awkward or anything, but one of the first things I say when someone does premarital counseling with me is, like one of the first sessions is, hey, I, I just want to, I want to know what your guys' boundaries are while you're dating or while you're engaged, and, uh, and I want you to create them. But I want you to create them, I want you to tell them to me, and I'm going to hold you accountable to them. 
And every time we meet, I'm just going to ask. I don't need any details. But I'm just going to ask, have you kept the boundaries that you've, you've learned? Because here's the thing. In all of these, it's like when you, when you feel, what would it look like to obey in this area? It would mean like, man, I would get to live a pure life for Christ. That's what that means. Now, I actually get to, to, to live the way God designed it. And because God designs it, I mean, sex was God's idea. He can direct it. So that's one area. Here's a second area that's big. Forgiveness. You know, it's like I, I, you know, I can obey God in every area of my life except forgiving that girl or that guy, or my dad, or my grandfather, or my mother, or my friend, or my ex-friend, or whatever it is, or my ex-boyfriend, or my ex-girlfriend. It's like, if you're a Christian, you have to forgive. I mean, you have to understand that the center of Christianity is forgiveness. And if you ask the question, is forgiveness costly? Yes. Look at the cross. Is forgiveness hard? Yes. Look at the cross. But what, here's, here's how forgiveness works, and, and I know it's not easy, but forgiveness is an act of the will one time and then an act of the will consistently over time. And so it's like you, you, know, you think about some girl that you know, you're, you're mad at or something, and, and you, you decide, I'm going to forgive her. And then you have to actually make a daily, sometimes daily, uh, certainly every time you hear her spoken well of, and you want to say a passive-aggressive comment to kind of say, well, yeah, but really, I mean, I don't mean to be mean, but here's you know, something else I'll say. Um, it's like, no, you actually have to see, you go, okay, every time I see her or see him, I'm going to make the decision. It's an act of the will. doesn't mean I forget. God doesn't forget what we've done. He's omniscient. He never forgets our sin. He decides to not hold, us against, it, hold it against us because of Christ. So, so forgiveness is a second big area. A third big area is money. And if you're going, is he talking about money on the first Sunday of the year? <laughs> yep. Uh, and, and I only do that because scripture, it's such a, it's such a sensitive issue. I, I had a pastor tell me years ago when I was, actually a couple years ago when I was coming to plant the church. He said, if you don't talk about money, you can't disciple people. Because it's such a part of their lives, whether they realize it or not. And, and, and what happens is, is people will say, I want to obey God in every area of my life except with what he would say about finances, which God clearly says, says give, save, live. We give first to honor God, we save second to be wise, and we live off the rest to teach ourselves contentment. And, and if you get, here's kind of a litmus test, if you get bothered when I talk about generous, generosity, it's because you're not a generous person. Generous people don't mind when generosity is talked about. They're like, this is great. I serve a generous God. I love being generous. I love seeing how God can use me and my possessions and my home, my resources to bless other people. But it's difficult. You know, we're talking to our kids over dinner and we got seven-year-old, five-year-old, two-year-old, and we've started to talk to them about giving, and they've got, they've got together just over $100. They've got some generous grandparents, okay? So they've got over $100, two of them. <clears throat> and we're talking to them, and my son's so cute. He's five. He's about to be five this month. He said, we have $100. Pretty soon we're going to have a million. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, man, if only it worked that way, you know? Um, it doesn't, but... But, he, but he, that's what he said, and, uh, and so we were talking to him, and we were having this, like, you know, conversation, and, and they know this, because we got great kids ministry that teaches them things, and we try to talk about things at home, and so we talk about, you know, who owns all, whose money is that really? Who's that $100 is that? Oh, it's God's. You know, God gives it to us, and okay, you guys, like, you manage it, and you steward it, and you were trying to use words they can understand, you take care of it, but it's really, oh, we get it. So would you like to give any of it back to the church? No. <laughs> <laughs> at least you're honest, all right? And I mean, that's what we can do a lot of times. We can go, I know God said this. Well, it could be my money. I know God said this, but, you know, that's, that's the beautiful thing about a seven-year-old and a five-year-old. They're just more honest than us. Uh, they, don't, they don't have the filter. They're just going to tell us what they think. So money's another one. Here's another one, living missionally. And so here's what I mean by that. The longer a person's a Christian, this is, I see, this is the temptation in my own life. Um, the longer somebody's a Christian, the more they can read their Bible and pray and be in community group and blogs and podcasts and vodcast and, you know, and sermons and, and all this kind of stuff and really, really be growing in a lot of ways, but never actually reach out to one person who's far from God but close to them. Study after study has shown that the uh, average church goer, we'll just say that, not necessarily Christian, but when they do studies, the average church goer never shares their faith outside their family. Isn't that interesting? The average churchgoer never shares their faith outside the family. They're good. They're, they do a decent job telling their kids. Maybe it, you know, a spouse will tell the other spouse if, they're, if one's a Christian, one's not. But the chance that a church-going person will tell somebody about their faith outside their family 
is very low percentages. And one of the things we would say here is that that is part of the joy of obeying Christ. It's part of that, man, I get to talk about what God's done in my life with other people. But oftentimes, it's the one area of our lives where we're like, God, I'll pray for that lost person, but I'm not going to share with them. And we've got to be committed to that. And here's the final one. The final one, I would say, just practically is baptism. And we've got a baptism Sunday next week, but what happens in people's lives is they, they give their life to Christ. Maybe they, they just did it. Maybe they did it weeks ago or months ago or even sometimes it's years ago. And they just they haven't stepped forward and been baptized. And then they start saying, well, I don't really need to be baptized because everybody already knows I'm a Christian. And I know it's part of the Great Commission. And I know the scripture is really clear. And I know the church has believed this for 2,000 years, but I'm the exception. And one of the things you want to say is if you have been a Christian, we don't care if you've been a Christian for 10 years and you want to get baptized, you've never been baptized, talk to us afterwards. Talk to me afterwards. We want to baptize you. We want to celebrate with you what God's doing in your life. There's no shame in that. So that's the first area. And that's why we talk, by the way, about obedience-based discipleship here. It's because it's not about what you know primarily. It's about what you know and obey. And so the first lie is that I only have to obey part of God's word. Let me show you the second thing. It shows up in verse 28. Turn with me to Judges 1, verse 28. It says this. When Israel grew strong... They put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not drive them out completely. Here's what, let me explain what's happening here. So at first, they would just let the people live in the land, even when God said they shouldn't. Now, they said, I've got an idea. This is kind of, they're getting more sophisticated with their sin, which is what we do oftentimes. They're learning how to manage their sin. And they said, I got a great idea. My enemies will work for me. My sin will work for me. Here's the second big lie. The second big lie is this. This is not what God has said, but it seems to be working for me. Think about that for a second. So the first lie is, I don't have to obey all God's word. And then when you realize you're not obeying all God's word, you're like, well, I I don't, I've kind of got some areas of secret sin in my life, and there's some areas I know I need to be more generous or sexually pure or forgive, but, but... But it seems to be working for me. And this is what happens. This is kind of the, if you're new, if you're not a Christian, this is, just so you know, this is kind of the temptations we struggle with as Christians, is to trade in bigger sins for littler sins that are easier to hide. You know, it's like, oh, I'm a Christian, so I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to commit adultery, but, you know, the person says, well, then I'll, I'll look at pornography. Well, I'm not going to look at pornography, but I'm going to still have a, a fantasy life where it's full of lust in my heart. And let me, let me tell you two areas, I think oftentimes, where people begin to say, okay, maybe they don't think, because we don't, we don't always do a good job. We do things. We don't often know what we're doing. We don't think about it. We don't act it out enough and kind of say, what am I actually doing? What, what people often do is they will allow a sin in their life to, to stay in their life because they think it's working for them. Here's one big example, lying. People are like, well, I've just been lying about this for so long. I've been lying about my struggle, or I've been lying about, you know, I've been lying to my spouse, or I've been lying to my husband, I've been lying to my kids, I've been lying to my boss, I've been lying to my clients. But when I do it, it seems to be working. The, my wife's not mad at me because she doesn't know. And I'm selling more than I've ever sold because I'm just kind of fabricating some of the details of it. And, and, and if I told the truth... If I actually really just decided to tell the truth, things would not go well for me. Well, here's, let me just tell you something. You're probably right in the short term. Telling the truth is a long-term game. That you have to know this. this, You will never tell the truth if you're looking for the short term. Telling the truth is a long-term game. People lie because of the short term. I'm afraid of what she'll say. It's like, well, what if, you just, you know, what if you just told each other the truth? What if that's what you did in your marriage? Because the only thing more dangerous than telling each other the truth is lying for 35 years to one another. And, but I'm just telling you, I see this all the time. Another area, and we've ta- I know we're talking a lot about sexual sin, but that's because, and we're going to see even in, this, in, this, in the Judges later in the book, that's one of the main sins that the, the people of Israel have always struggled with. But what, I, what I've seen with sexual sin it is oftentimes somebody says, you know, I'm looking at pornography, but the reason that I'm looking at pornography is because if I wasn't looking at pornography, I'd be doing something worse. 
I mean, I remember, I, I've been in several men's bathrooms where there are, you know, they, they've got funny posters on the walls and, you know, in, in, these, in these restaurants. And a couple different times I've seen the poster that says, with a guy smiling on, it's a cartoon, it's supposed to be a big joke, says, porn saved my marriage. And I'm like, this has become such a thing that they've made posters about it. It's kind of a funny idea, I guess, to some people. But it's like, no, porn does not save your marriage. Porn actually destroys your marriage because it actually destroys the heart and mind God gave you. And then it, it destroys your desire for your spouse. It creates unrealistic expectations. It makes you selfish and inward focused in all of your sexuality. It makes you think everything's about yourself. It helps in no way. But people will begin to say, well, this is why I'm doing it. People say, I'm cohabitating because it saves us money. And so I have to, I have to live together with, you know, with, because, because if I didn't do this, then, then we couldn't afford it. It's like, well, then you need to find different roommates. You need to live at a less of a lifestyle for a season. You need to get a different job, whatever it is. Because here's what happened, and this is, let this be a lesson to all of us. If you read the story of, of Judges, um, what happens with all of the people that the Israelites tried to manage and control in every one of the circumstances, those people rebelled against them. See, it says when Israel got strong, it did this. It's like, yeah, yeah, I'll manage these things. They won't get out of control in my life. I'm not going to get addicted. I'm the exception. This won't destroy my marriage. It's destroyed other marriages. It won't destroy mine. I can abuse these substances, and it won't, it won't affect me. It's affected everybody else, but it won't affect me. And what we see is everything begins to, this is the rest of the book of Judges and most of the Old Testament, the things that the Israelites did not take care of early in their life plagued them the rest of their lives. Whew. Which leads to the third lie, which is this, that there will be no consequences for my sin. That there will be no consequences for my sin. And I don't know if you're putting this together. The three lies that they believe in Judges chapter 1 are the same three lies that our first parents, Adam and Eve, believed in Genesis chapter 3. The serpent comes and says, um, did God really say? And what is he saying? You don't, you don't have to obey all God's word. He's making them question God's word. And then he's saying, oh, no, 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 you can, you can actually eat of the tree. It's actually going to work to your advantage. Then you'll be like God. So sin and, and make it work for you, and you'll actually become better. And then he says, uh, and no, you will not surely die. There's no consequences. There's no punishment for sin. And I want us to see in uh, Judges chapter 2, what God says, Judges chapter 2, verse 2 says this, And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land, and you shall break down the altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this that you have done? And look what verse 3 says. So now I say, I will not drive them out before you. I want you to hear this. There is sometimes, if you don't deal with an issue, it becomes so overwhelming, it's almost impossible to deal with. Which is why you need community. Some of you have been struggling with the same sin forever, and you're like, I can handle it. No, you can't. If you would have, you would have done it already. You actually need help. You need community. You need accountability. And listen, this isn't even in my notes. Um, there is a difference between privacy and secrecy. You should never have secrecy, but you can have privacy. Privacy is everybody doesn't need to know my sin. Secrecy is nobody needs to know my sin. And, and what we need is we need a church that's committed to privacy but not secrecy. Uh, we're not saying tell everybody all your sins. We're just saying you need to begin to open up in your life about your struggles. Because here's what God's going to say. I want you to see verse 3. So now I say to you, I will not drive them out before you, but here's what happens to sin if, if it's unkept, if you don't get to the root and deal with it. But they shall become thorns in your side, painful, And their God shall become a snare to you. I want to talk for a moment about the difference between consequences and punishment. God, if you're a Christian, God has punished your sin at the cross. That's what Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ said, I will take on the punishment, the eternal punishment for sin for every person who would ever trust and believe in me. So, if you're a Christian, the punishment for sin, you don't have to worry about, which is actually very pastorally helpful. You go, it's not punishment. God punished one person. His name was Jesus Christ. God does not punish the same sin twice. Okay, but there are consequences for your sin, especially in this life. And so 
Let me, let me give you kind of an example. One of, one, of the, one of the scary things is that we see in the book of Judges and other places is that sin becomes, if not dealt with, sin becomes generational. And you've heard this. We even, I think, use this kind of you know, language of, of kind of passing it on among the, you know, father to son and mother to daughter. It's like, well, how does that happen? Well, it's not like, a, it's not like a, it's not, don't think of it overly spiritual. Like, how does my sin get passed on to my kids? Does it like happen at night when I'm not looking and does like the sin move from me to them? It's like, no, what happens is when you live a sinful lifestyle or you allow certain sins in your life, you normalize them before your kids. And a lot of times, it's just a good thing that you went way too far on. A lot of, it's like, yeah, yeah, our family's obsessed with entertainment, and we're obsessed with sports, and that's really kind of what we worship in our family. And so if we do that for 25 years, then everybody who grows up in our home, guess what they do? They worship sports, and they worship entertainment, and their whole life's about what's the next thing that's going to entertain them. Think about a godly family that otherwise very, very godly, but just has a love for money. Because our society has a deep love for money. It's like, well, what happens? Well, then you raise your kids for 20 or 25 years in a home that has a love for money. And then you wonder, why do they struggle with a love for money so much when they get older? It's like, because you never dealt with that sin. Here's, here's another thing. This is why we have to repent in front of our kids all the time. You know, it, it, you know every, I mean, basically almost every time, no, I'm, I'm, that's making me sound too good. Not all the time, okay? <laughs> but, but, but when we try to confront our kids with, and, and, and talk to them about their sin, what we try to do is, if we can, almost say mom and dad struggle with the same thing. You know, we don't want you to lie. And dad's tempted to lie. And, and, when, and I don't want to be a liar. And I don't want you to be a liar. And I'm tempted with the very same things. I know you're angry and you don't think life's fair, and that's why you're screaming about this. I, I get angry a lot of times when I don't think life's fair. And I need to, you get what I'm saying? You just, you just that's, that's part of the way you break the generational curse is you repent in front of your kids. And so there, there, are, <clears throat> there are consequences for sin, but the punishment of sin is gone. Well, how do we change? It's all in verse one. You're like, well, where is, in all of this, where is the gospel? Well, I'm excited to show you this. In Judges chapter two, verse one, he says this. Now an angel of the Lord went up from Gilgah to Bacham, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. In that verse, you can see three things. First, God said, I brought you out of the land. In other words, if you want to fight sin in your life, if you want to obey God in areas you've not been obeying God, you need to remember what God did for you. It's like what he, when he says, I brought you out of Egypt, here's what we mean. When you became a Christian, when I saved you, when I forgave you, when I took you out of your slavery. And then he said, and then I gave you the land. And God said, I gave you forgiveness, and I gave you my word, and I gave you my spirit, and I gave you my church. And I gave you a new mind, and I gave you a new heart. And then he said, and I'll never break my covenant. In other words, I gave you my promises. God has given you everything necessary. You need to take it. You need to welcome it. You need to embrace it. You need to receive it. If you're in this room right now and you're like, you know what? I don't even know if I'm a Christian. The way you stop the cycle of sin is by starting to give your life to Christ. You start by giving your life to Christ. You go, I want to break this cycle of sin, and the way I do it is not by trying harder and working harder and training harder. You actually need a new heart. You need a new mind. And you give your life to Christ. And that's what I'd say. If you're here today, I would say receive Christ personally. Welcome him into your life. He's done everything necessary to save you. He took the punishment for your sin on the cross. And for the rest of us, what we need to do, I think the reason that we don't fight these areas in our lives. I'm talking about the, and they're called in this text, the Jebusites. That's what the people were called. The Jebusites were who they would not drive out. I believe the reason we don't fight the Jebusites in, the, in our lives, the sin left in our lives, is two reasons. One, we keep making excuses or it's our escape. The, the reason that we don't fight this sin, we're kind of in between, I feel guilty enough about it to know it's a sin, but not strong enough about it to do anything. And so, it, what if 2019, what would it look like if everybody in this room, everybody who can see me and hear me, if everybody in this room said, that's it, no more excuses. I can't make excuses and progress at the same time. I have to stop making excuses and I have to start finding reasons. I'm going to have more joy in Christ. My marriage is going to be better. Here's what you need. You need a vision and a counter vision for your life be a great thing to spend a couple hours in the new year doing. What is the vision for my life? In other words, what could I become if I was actually faithful to Christ? 
What could my marriage become? What could my life become? How could God use me? Could God use me like he even used Joshua and other judges in this book? But then you need a counter vision. And a counter vision is what will life be like if you don't deal with this area of your life? Do you want to be the guy who's still hiding his porn habit into his 50s? You don't want to be that guy. Do you want to be the woman who's still just angry and yelling at her husband and hasn't dealt with any of that stuff in bitterness? You don't want to be that person. You don't want to be a grandma and still struggling with the same sins that you were struggling with as a mom. And it happens and there's God's grace, but anybody who's in that situation would say, deal with it. Stop making excuses. And here's the issue. The issue is sacrifice. You're going to have to make some hard decisions. What do you sacrifice? Whatever is most valuable to you that's stopping you. Whatever is most valuable to you you're like, I've got to stop doing this. If I'm going to really live for Christ. It could be a good thing. It could be a similar thing. I've got to stop doing this. I've got to sacrifice. And the great truth of Scripture is, is God meets us in all of that. There's so much grace that comes from the cross. And Jesus Christ, the moment that you see, here's what's beautiful in this book. When the people repent, God listens. When the people turn and they ask for help, God comes. And at the beginning of 2019, it is a great time to repent. It's a great time to say, I want to put to death the sin in my life so I can love and live for Christ more. Let's pray for that as a church. Let's pray. Lord, that's our prayer. We want to just, we want to sacrifice for you, Lord. We, you did the greatest sacrifice for us, Lord. And now we want to be done making excuses and we want to start finding reasons and there's tons in the scripture. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. It's like, well, what would be the reason to be pure in heart? Well, because we want to see you. The Apostle Paul says the love of money is a, is a snare. And it leads to all types of trouble in this life, Lord. And you, you want to, you want to um, save us and deliver us from our sins, especially the ones we're trying to hide, especially the ones we find comfort in, especially the ones we try to escape to, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would be our escape. In 2019, we would turn to you, Lord, and we would remember what you've done. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.